just a minute to put this webinar into context with the ENGAGE project. As you know, people have been studying student retention for decades. The reports and studies line bookshelves and take up space on computers. But you also know that there seems to be this disconnect between research and practice. And that's where ENGAGE comes into play. ENGAGE is an extension service project funded by the National Science Foundation's GSE program. Extension service projects are a very exciting and rather unique NSF program because there is no research being conducted. Rather, the work is in the mechanisms and strategies that faculty and administrators use to put the research, in this case on retention, into practice. The goal of ENGAGE is to increase the capacity of engineering schools to retain undergraduate students by facilitating the implementation of research-based strategies to improve the educational experience. Our focus is on first and second year students because these students are most apt to switch out of engineering. We're currently working with teams from 20 engineering schools to implement three strategies that research indicates improves student retention. The engaged strategies are to improve and increase interaction between faculty and students. The topic of today's webinar, which is to use everyday examples in engineering to teach technical concepts. And the third strategy is to improve students' spatial visualization skills. We've selected these strategies because they improve student interest and engagement in engineering. And while they work for all students, they have a particularly strong impact on women students. As I mentioned before, we're currently working formally with 20 engineering schools. These schools on this screen, uh, the first 10, were selected to be in the first cohort of engaged schools. And we've been working with teams of four faculty and staff from each of these schools for more than a year. In June of 2011, these additional 10 schools joined the ENGAGE project, and another 10 schools will be added in 2012. Although we're formally working with a specific set of schools, all engineering schools have access to materials and support from engaged staff and consultants. And we really urge you, if you're interested in what we're talking about here and other, the other two strategies fully explored on the Engage website, to give us a call, send us an email. So at this point, I'm delighted to introduce you to our moderator. Pat Campbell, the co-PI of Engage and president of Campbell Kibler Associates. Pat? Thanks, Susan. Hello, everyone. It's really wonderful to have you here. And I'm very excited about today's webinar. Um, as Susan said, that um, I'm here as the co-PI of Engage, but also as someone who cares a lot about everyday examples, has been working on them for quite a while. I and Engage as a whole are so delighted that ASEE is co-sponsoring this webinar. As folks with a strong commitment to make engineering education the best it possibly can be, you're the perfect group for us to work with, and we're really glad that you're here. But before we start, we'd like to find out a little bit more about you and who's on the webinar today. So could you please respond to this question about who's on the call today? And when you're finished, just hit submit. And we're hoping it won't take you a long time to decide which you are. OK, here we are. OK, so approximately half of you, about 46%, are faculty members, uh, followed by the ever popular other. I'm always curious about who other is. We're going to have to break that down further afterwards. Uh, department chairs or deans are about 13 percent. Um, administrators are about 5 percent, and graduate students and postdocs are about 8 percent. So it's really nice to have such a diverse group, and it's particularly nice to have so many of you being faculty members because you are the ones 
that we're really looking at when we're talking about everyday examples. Now, let me take a minute and introduce today's presenter, Dr. Ian Patterson. Okay. Ian is the Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award holder and A.A. A. Griffith Chair of Structural Materials and Mechanics in the School of Engineering at the University of Liverpool. And if that's not enough, Ian also holds a joint appointment as a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science at Michigan State University where he leads the Experimental Mechanics Research Group. This is probably not going to come as a surprise to you, but his research interests are in experimental mechanics, with applications in aerospace, biomechanics, and structural integrity. If that's not enough, he's also a fellow of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers and of the Society for Experimental Mechanics. But believe it or not, as impressive as all that is, that's not why he's here today. He's here today because he's our guru of everyday examples in engineering. And that's what he's going to be talking to you about. Now, you should know, everyday examples are not design challenges and neither are they projects. Rather, they're objects that are familiar to students, like iPods, sausages, and even Winnie the Pooh, that can be used to better demonstrate or teach concepts related to engineering to students. But that's enough from me. Let's go over to you, Ian. Thanks, Pat. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm glad you're able to join us this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start out by uh, giving you an outline of what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to start with an introduction, uh, give you some idea of some, uh, about some pilot studies that we've done and the results we got, and discuss uh, some of the pedagogical uh, justification for the ideas that are going to come later in the webinar. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, what everyday engineering examples actually are and what is everyday for our students. And then uh, finally, I'm going to talk about in how to engage students, how to attract and hold their attention using everyday engineering examples. So let me talk first about uh, some findings we have obtained from a pilot study uh, that we did a little while ago. And uh, the reference to the pilot study is at the bottom of the slide. It's in uh, ASWE uh, Proceedings from 2008. Uh, and we found uh, that uh, for concepts illustrated with everyday engineering examples, significantly more students rated their learning as high or significant than in the control class. We also found that the overall value of everyday engineering examples correlated very highly with the contribution to understanding. And then we had a third finding, which was that the learning was independent of the level of difficulty in the everyday engineering examples that we used. And that final point is quite important and uh, relevant to uh, some of the things we're going to talk about uh, later on uh, in the webinar. So now I'd like to find out a little bit more about uh, you folks that are listening to me. And so I'd like to think about which of these statements best describes you. Are you flexible and open-minded, happy to have a go at new things without preparation? If you are, vote one in a moment. Or are you careful and cautious? You like to investigate a new topic or process in depth before trying it, in which case vote two in a moment. Or are you realistic, oh, sorry, do you like realistic but flexible plans? And you like to try things out by practicing to see if they work? If so, vote three. Or do you like to plan events for the last detail and to know the right answers before you try something new? In which case, vote four. So the poll should uh, appear in a moment. And so now if you'd like to vote for one of these, are you flexible and open-minded, happy to try new things? Or careful and cautious, investigate before trying? or you like realistic, flexible plans, try things out by practicing, or four, uh, you like to plan in detail and to know the answers before trying. So if you could vote now for us, please. And so we'll close the poll in a moment. Okay, so uh, you can see the results on screen now. Uh, so just over half of us are uh, realistic but flexible and like to try things out by practicing. 
and then uh, just under a third of us are in the first category, that's um, flexible, and open-minded, happy to try new things, and then we've got a um, smaller percentage, about 17% here, uh, careful and cautious, and a very small number, 3%, like to plan uh, in detail and know the answers before uh, trying. So that's a fairly um, typical sort of distribution that we get in these webinars. Um, hang on to, to uh, which one uh, you selected and, and we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. So now if we uh, move on. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about how people learn and in particular use uh, Dr. Kolob's uh, learning style inventory uh, that he published back in the uh, 70s. And uh, he plotted on the x-axis doing versus uh, watching. He called doing active experimentation and he called watching reflective observation. And then on the y-axis he plotted feeling versus thinking. And he called feeling a concrete experience and thinking abstract conceptualization. And so then he categorized the way people learn in each of these quadrants. And so in the first quadrant here, people who uh, learn by doing and feeling, he called accommodators. And then the second quadrant, people who learn by watching and feeling, he called divergers. And in the third quadrant, people who learn by watching and thinking, he called assimilators. And then the fourth quadrant here, people who learn by doing and thinking, he called convergers. And uh, if you look now at uh, how you voted, so most, uh, we had the biggest percentage, 51% uh, thought uh, they were realistic and flexible, so they're probably uh, assimilators. They probably learn by watching and uh, thinking. Uh, we had quite a few accommodators, it was about a third of the uh, audience who learned by, prefer to learn by doing and, and feeling, and then we had uh, smaller percentages, uh, divergers and uh, convergers. So let me just uh, switch here to a quote uh, from Adams and Felder. Uh, they said, the educational role of faculty is not to impart knowledge, but to design learning environments that support knowledge acquisition. And I'd like to add to that quote, for all students, bearing in mind that our distribution of students will not look dissimilar to the distribution we got in the last poll. In other words, spread across the four learning types. Now some of you will have been sitting there listening to me talk about Colob's uh, learning styles and thinking oh, that's not quite right. Uh, and indeed uh, Honey and Mumford suggested it wasn't quite right and that in fact we tend to cycle through different learning modes with a preference for one of the quadrants. And so Honey and Mumford replotted the graph, they kept the same axes so we've still got uh, doing versus watching on the uh, x-axis and feeling versus thinking on uh, the y-axis. But they said we tend to start in the first quadrant by having an experience and they called that being an activist. And then we move into the second quadrant and review the experience and in this phase we're being a reflector. And then we cycle into the third quadrant and draw some conclusions from the experience and they call that being a theorist, and then complete the cycle as a pragmatist planning the next steps, and off we go round the cycle again. And so their view of the way we learn is that we cycle around this, but we have a preference, and we may get stuck in one of these quadrants and not be terribly keen to move on to the next one as a consequence of our predisposition to learn in a particular way. There's a key word here, and that is experience occurs in three of the four uh, quadrants. And experience is an important part of how we learn. Doris Lessing, who's a recent Nobel laureate in literature, said that is what learning is. You understand something you've understood all your life, but in a new way. And that nicely sums up what we'd like our students to do when we're using everyday engineering examples. We'd like them to look at something that they have understood all their life, but now to understand it in a new way with engineering insight. 
our difficulty is that our students arrive uh, in our uh, classes as freshmen and uh, sophomores with very limited lab or industrial experience, probably a lot less uh, than many of us had at that point. And our task is to find their common experiences and use them to illustrate engineering principles. And I'd like to propose that everyday engineering examples provide a common pool of experiences that we can use in the classroom. And so if we go back to Honey and Mumford's cycle, then having an experience, what we're looking for is an everyday experience that the students will have had, all of them will have had, before they arrive in the classroom. So this bit is done before we start the learning process formally in the classroom. And then this piece, being a reflector and reviewing the experience, is something that we as instructors can lead in the classroom and showing them how the engineering principles that we're teaching apply to the everyday experience they've already had. And then we can move them into the third quadrant here as theorists concluding from the experience. And this could either be uh, something you do in class uh, with them or it might be an exercise you set them for homework so that they begin to engage in the learning process themselves. So that finally, the fourth step is something that is student-led, that they begin to plan the next steps. So next time they have this everyday experience, they look at it in a new light and pull new information out of the experience, new understanding to enhance their understanding of the engineering principle. So let me get you, uh, you actively engaged again uh, and ask you uh, to uh, participate in, in another poll. Uh, so can I ask you, uh, how old are you? Are you one under 30, two between 30 and 39, three between 40 and 49, four between 50 and 59, or five over 60? So the poll should pop up on screen in a moment. There it goes. Uh, so this should be an easy one. Uh, just uh, click on the, the appropriate one for us and let's see what sort of distribution we have in our audience uh, this afternoon. Okay, there we go. Uh, so we've, we've got a fairly um, uniform spread from uh, the mid-30s upwards. We've got a couple of under-30s uh, and then uh, about equal numbers of uh, 40s to 49, 50 to 59s, and uh, the over 60s are a small, uh, small number more than the rest. Um, so we have a large uh, number of us who are significantly older than the students we're going to teach. And so if we think about um, what didn't exist at high school for us that does now, for that small number that are under 30, the flash drive didn't exist when you were at high school. For those between 30 and 39, the digital MP3 player didn't exist, nor did the flash drive. And certainly my teenage kids would be hard pressed to exist without those two little devices. If you're between 40 and 49, then uh, there was no digital camera and no graphing calculator, and of course, no MP3 player or flash drive either. Uh, if you're like me, you're between 50 and 59, uh, then we had no internet at high school, no spreadsheet, and no solar powered calculator, plus, of course, the digital camera and graphing calculator and all the rest of them. And if you're over 60, then when you were at high school, as well as all these things I've already highlighted, there was no video cassette recorder and no pocket calculator. The, all these devices uh, have dramatically changed uh, the way our students study and uh, do their uh, homework and their leisure time as well. And so their experience of everyday life is uh, so different to ours that it's warranted an anthropological uh, study. And uh, Rebecca Nathan, uh, whose picture you can see on screen, uh, who's an anthropologist uh, for uh, her sabbatical uh, year, went and became a freshman uh, in another university, so she could study the cultural gap between students and professors. And she's published her um, results in a book called My Freshman Year. It's available in paperback from Penguin, um, and uh, hardback's available from uh, 
Cornell University Press, and it's uh, it's well worth a read to get an appreciation of um, the vast difference between uh, what our uh, students experience and our experiences when we were students, as well as uh, our experience of life today relative to theirs. So, in that context, what are everyday engineering examples? Well, what we're looking for are familiar, real-life objects and situations that we can use to illustrate engineering uh, principles. Now, the level of idealization should be minimized to retain uh, the relevance and the context. And if I can just um, recall for you one of the outcomes of our pilot study, which was that the level of learning uh, was, or contribution to learning was not correlated to the level of difficulty in the everyday engineering examples that we chose. Uh, which we believe tells us that, it, that if we choose the appropriate examples, the students will stick with it and uh, get to grasp with a difficult example if they can see that it's relevant and it's in the right uh, context for them. So all of this means that the choice of examples is critical. There needs to be a transparent connection to the student's experience. At the same time, the example needs to provide a basis for straightforward implementation of engineering principles. So that's quite hard. And so we've uh, come up with two uh, essential attributes uh, when uh, selecting or, or uh, designing everyday engineering examples uh, to use uh, with students. So the first essential attribute is that examples need to be familiar uh, to all students. So using sailboats to teach vectors uh, might work uh, in Maine, uh, but not in the Midwest, where they may never have seen a sailboat or been on one. Walnuts falling from trees to illustrate kinematics of particles uh, might work on a tree-lined rural campus, but it's probably irrelevant for an urban inner city uh, university. Happens, what, sorry, what happens is that uh, students may panic at the context. That's something they're not familiar with, they haven't thought about before. And then they fail to listen to what you're saying and the principles that you're trying to explain because they're too busy trying to grasp the example that you're using. And we've probably all experienced this in the context of, of uh, examinations when we set something out of context. Same happens in lectures. Okay, our second essential attribute for everyday engineering examples is that we should pose questions with useful or interesting answers. And this is important because the absence of a useful or interesting endpoint simply creates a tedious intellect, intellectual exercise and our students can spot those from a mile off and it will disengage very quickly. And research has shown that the perceived usefulness of learning influences students' motivation. So what we're looking for are what Art Heinricher, Dean of Undergraduate Studies at WPI, describes as fruitful applications. So let me give you some examples. So my first example uh, is for freshman chemical uh, engineering courses. Uh, it was uh, submitted to us uh, by a group from Rowan University. Uh, you can find it on our website at www.engageengineering.org. And uh, we've called it guilt-free chocolate. Uh, the topics that you can cover uh, with this is uh, food processing, uh, good manufacturing uh, practices, measurements, and statistics. And the activity that uh, Karen and her uh, colleagues have suggested is you have the, children, uh, have the, the, um, the students melt chocolate in a microwave, which they'll have done as, uh, as young children, I'm sure, uh, dip the cookies in them, and then before they eat them, uh, measure and calculate the, the, uh, the change in nutritional data for the cookies with the chocolate on compared to before we put the chocolate on, and then let them eat them. And I'm sure with the prospect of eating them, you'll have them uh, engaged. My second example uh, is called Winnie the Pooh and uh, Piglet. Um, this is the one that Pat mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this was contributed by Chad Young of Nickel State University, and again, you'll find it on our website at engageengineering.org. It's aimed at uh, freshman physics. Uh, the topic this time is buoyancy. And uh, the activity here is that uh, you show a video of Winnie the Pooh 
um, floating up in the air, uh, hanging on to the string of his um, balloon. And then uh, you can discuss uh, buoyancy with them. And then you can ask the students uh, to calculate the number of helium balloons needed to lift them in a lawn chair. And when uh, they've done that, you can then show them this video. And uh, this is on YouTube, and the link uh, is uh, in Chad's uh, little uh, piece about this example. And uh, I'm going to uh, just switch the sound here to play the video for you. Uh, so bear with me while I do that. So this is not uh, an everyday example that I suggest you do yourselves. Um, although if you look on uh, YouTube, you'll find there's quite a lot of uh, people who are mad enough to have tried it. OK, let me move on to our uh, third example. Uh, this one is uh, called Food Cartons and uh, Boxes. And uh, this one was submitted by uh, Cheryl Sorby of Michigan Tech University. Uh, again, it's on our website. Um, it's aimed at freshman engineering graphics courses. Uh, the topic is pattern development. And uh, our suggestion is that uh, you collect some old cereal boxes, as, as in the photograph here, and distribute them uh, to the students. And have the students estimate the volume and surface area of the boxes. And then have them disassemble the boxes and actually measure the area of the card used and compare that uh, with their estimates of the surface area and with the volume that uh, was enclosed with the card. And then you can discuss how box manufacturers could minimize waste, for instance, by tessellating uh, the boxes together and the way in which uh, they design the flaps and so on on the boxes. OK, a little uh, uh, poll for you here. Uh, who said, it's very hard, so I try and make it as engaging as it can be, but you have to face the fact that no matter how good it is, you can only hold their attention for a little while. Was it one, our moderator today, uh, Pat Campbell? Two, Eric Clapton? Three, Bill Clinton? Four, Richard Feynman, the famous uh, physicist? Or five, Charles Vest, uh, chairman of the National Engineering uh, Academy and uh, previous uh, president of uh, MIT? So the polls popped up now. Which of these uh, five do you think it might be? And uh, I'll just give you a little clue to, uh, to help you along. So this is the sort of applause that uh, the person who said this generally gets. I think everyone's voted, and uh, one third uh, who thought it was uh, Eric Clapton are right. Um, I guess Richard Feynman might have said it, but, but it's not recorded. Um, and in fact, he was uh, talking about his kids. Uh, it's a quote from the San Diego Union Tribune of uh, 2005, uh, and I think we've all experienced this in, um, in trying to maintain the attention of uh, small children, but it doesn't get any easier uh, when they grow up and uh, come into our classes as young adults. So I'd like to talk now about uh, how we can engage our students. And by that I mean how to attract and hold fast their attention. So it's hanging on to it as well as getting it that, that we need to think about. And our problem is uh, that our students suffer from uh, what's being called the disease of the modern age, continuous partial attention. The consequence of that is that we need to think about short pieces. They've got a relatively short attention plan and span, and we need to re-engage them perhaps several times uh, during a class. And I'd like to suggest that you can use everyday engineering examples to engage students 
and to help maintain, hold fast their attention. Okay, so for my, uh, my next example, I've got uh, three more. Uh, each of these is taken uh, from one of these uh, four uh, booklets. Uh, the booklets are available as a hard copy from the website at the bottom of the slide, engineeringexamples.org. Uh, and we'll be sending out uh, PDF uh, copies of these uh, to all uh, participants on the webinar uh, today. And so uh, my fourth example is uh, called uh, Cupcakes uh, with a Candle. It's uh, aimed at uh, sophomore thermodynamics. And the topic is reacting mixtures and combustion. Uh, and we've made uh, some videos of um, these. And so I'm going to take a break and let you watch the video instead. It's available on our uh, website, which I'm showing you now uh, on screen. Um, the sound is, may not be brilliant, um, but I can assure you, if you go and watch it yourself on our website afterwards, the sound there is fantastic. So just bear with us a moment while I switch the sound here so you can hear it. So our next example is related to sophomore thermodynamics, and we call it cupcakes with a can. The topic is uh, reacting mixtures and combustion. And our suggestion is that you take a cupcake uh, and a candle and a glass jar into class. And then a uh, light the candle. and invite sealed bids on the time it'll take to extinguish the candle when it's covered with the jar. So if you're watching this uh, with a group of people, you might like to uh, have your guess now. And you can discuss uh, the combustion of uh, paraffin and the value of uh, energy emitted because these candles are principally made from paraffin. And so, in a jar this size, it'll take about 15 or 20 seconds for the candle to go out. There it goes. And so then you can give the cupcake to the winning student. And I think you'll have their attention if you do this sort of demonstration. And then once you've done it, you can invite students to calculate the quantity of natural gas required to cook a pan of pasta back in their residence. Okay, and for my fifth example, I'm going to show you uh, another one of these short videos. Uh, this time it's in the fluid section. And here we go. Our next example is called Soap Bubbles. It's designed for a fluids course and the topic is the property of fluids. And what we suggest you do is invite students to blow some bubbles using a straw and some detergent solution. So let's see if we can get some decent So when they've done that successfully, we can ask them to draw a free body diagram for a section of the spherical stationary bubble. And when they've done that, you can discuss the surface of the fluid behaves like a tension membrane and explain that the detergent acts like a circuit with local variations in concentration, allowing change in tension to accommodate shape changes. So you can see where the bubble is contouring around the end of the straw, it's not quite spherical, but it can hold that shape as a consequence of the detergent. Okay. Just give me a moment while I reorganize my sound here. And also my screen. Bring back the PowerPoint. So my last example is uh, about uh, running a skateboard into class. That'll certainly uh, get the class's attention if, uh, like me, you're in your 50s. Um, it's aimed at sophomore mechanics of solids, and the topic is bending moments and shear stress diagrams. Uh, the activity uh, that, that we suggest with this one is that you ask the students to work in pairs to construct a shear force and bending moment diagram for you standing on the skateboard. Uh, and then when they've done that, and, and uh, depending on how advanced they are, you may or may not have to help them with that, you can then show them uh, how to find the shear forces and bending moments in a plank bridge as a skateboarder uh, 
uh, passes over them, over it. And uh, then, uh, so that they can evaluate uh, their own understanding, you can ask students to find the shear forces and bending moment for a unicyclist passing over the plank bridge, which is a little uh, easier. And you'll find all the working uh, for each of those stages uh, in the real life examples in Mechanics of Solids booklet that uh, we'll be sending out as a PDF. So at the beginning, I started out by telling you some of the results that we got from our own pilot studies. So we found that significantly more students rated their learning as high or significant than in our control classes. We also found that the overall value of our everyday engineering examples correlated very highly with their contribution to understanding, and that the learning was not tied to the level of difficulty. There was one other finding that I didn't reveal at the, uh, the very beginning, uh, but I think is quite important to us as uh, instructors, and that is that the teaching effectiveness was rated significantly higher compared to a control class uh, when we used everyday engineering examples. So uh, not only uh, will you have students uh, who are uh, more engaged and uh, who learn more uh, when you use this approach, but they'll also give you a higher rating um, in the assessments uh, of ratings at the end of, uh, of the semester, which must be a good thing for us. So if you'd like more information on um, the philosophy and approaches that I've been talking about, uh, then uh, Pat and I together with a couple of our colleagues have written these uh, ideas up in a paper that you can find in the European Journal of Engineering Education uh, in the, uh, the June issue of this year. So finally, I'd like to say to you, uh, think big, start small, and act now. And so uh, if you haven't uh, asked questions during the course of the webinar, please feel free to uh, type them in now, and uh, we'll take, sessions, uh, take questions uh, for the next few minutes. Pat, over to you. Thanks, Ian. And uh, I have to say, I really love your videos, but I want one of you going into the class on a skateboard. I suspect that's what <laughs> participants will all use in their classes. Uh, the first question that we have is one that I can answer. It's uh, one of the uh, participants asked, when will we get the PDFs? And you will get the PDFs in about a month, about four weeks. We'll send them all off to you. Um, they're PDFs, so feel free to pass them on to anyone and everyone. In fact, we would love that. So let me get to some other questions that I can't answer, but perhaps Ian can. So Ian, one of our folks wants to know, how do I know if what I think is relevant and engaging for students actually is? Oh, I think uh, you'll see a change in uh, the students' um, response and behavior towards you. Uh, most people who have tried these out report that uh, they get many more students approaching them at the end of uh, class or in the corridor um, and uh, or coming to, to office hours uh, to talk about their own experiences of the everyday experiences that, that uh, have been used in class. So I think you'll know when you've hit the button because uh, the students will tell you. Great. And we got another question just now, which is another one that I'm going to be able to answer. Uh, where a participant wants to know, um, will the slides be made available? And the answer is, uh, we have the whole webinar up, will be up on the website, um, and you're welcome to use that. Now, the slides as a whole, as a separate PowerPoint, um, I'm pretty sure we can make that happen. And if we can, we will, and we'll let you know. So let me go back to another teaching and learning question that we've gotten. Um, which is, and this is one I know everybody worries about. With my teaching and research load, I don't have the time to revamp my curriculum. Can I still use everyday examples? And if so, how? Well, we're very conscious uh, of that and that the, uh, the pressure that, um, particularly for, for young um, faculty, that um, they feel from chairs and, uh, and deans and so uh, we've tried to make this as easy as possible. Uh, and that's why we've produced these uh, booklets uh, and why we have a, um, a large number of, of examples on our website. Uh, so that you can pick these up and embed them 
uh, in your classes with a minimum of effort. Um, so in the uh, booklets, we have complete lesson plans laid out that you could pick up and use for an hour uh, in class um, with all the working and all the explanation uh, provided there for you. Or you can just pick bits of them and, and slot them into to your normal uh, teaching routine as, uh, as you wish. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible to get the activation energy as low as possible uh, so that you can use this and, and transform the way you teach. Great, Ian, thanks. And now here comes a wonderful question, particularly based on your earlier comments about how things are different than they were for those of us of a certain age when we were undergrads. So uh, one of our participants is teaching a mixed age class where folks range in age from 17 to 47. And he would like to know, how should he use E3s? Well, it's certainly more of a, a, a challenge um, uh, with the with the age uh, spread, um, but I think there are probably still examples that will resonate uh, across uh, the age difference. You may just need to be careful about the technologies that are present uh, in your examples. Um, after all, the cupcake one uh, seems to resonate with uh, people from 60 down to uh, three or four. Um, so I think there are examples you can use, but you, need, you certainly need to think about um, the uh, makeup of your class, both in terms of age, but maybe also gender and ethnicity. Uh, that's a good point. Um, and I know that, uh, right, I'm sorry, I'm reading all the questions that are coming in. They're coming in at a great rate, which is really exciting. Uh, one of the questions is, I teach math. Uh, do you have more examples for my students in grades K through college? Um, certainly one of the things about Engage is we're focusing on um, undergrads, particularly freshmen and sophomore. Uh, and so there are some math uh, examples that are on the site, uh, but again, they are at the college level. Uh, what we will do for this particular participant is after the session, uh, provide some resources for the math examples that are available from other sites uh, for to use with under with pre college. So, so Pat, um, at, Pat, at this yeah. stage, would it would it be worth just putting the the site on screen here for them? Oh, I um, think that's an excellent idea. So, so for I've, those I've, of you, go very ahead, good point. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in the examples. Uh, this is the website. It's engageengineering.org. Uh, we have, uh, we're searching for hundreds of examples, but at this point we have well over a hundred. And as you can see, that they cover a variety of different areas. And so after the uh, webinar is over, feel free to go in and download as many examples as you can get and anything that you might want to use. Um, so let me also, while you've got that on the screen, go back to uh, some of the other questions that are coming in. Uh, one of the questions, Ian, which I think is a really interesting one, is do you have any experience with students coming up with their own examples? Uh, yes, we do. And, and uh, doing this sort of thing often simulates students to come up with their own examples. Um, and uh, we've had examples of, of uh, both them bringing connected experiences uh, uh, to share with the class or with the instructor, but also uh, uh, presenting their, their own uh, examples that were unconnected with uh, the examples that have been used in class. Um, in both cases, I think it's, it's um, useful and, and uh, helpful to their uh, learning process. Uh, I just would, would uh, say a slight word of caution about um, students um, pursuing examples on their own without assistance from um, an instructor because it can be sometimes be difficult, uh, particularly for a freshman or sophomore student, uh, to, to see how to idealize an example in order to be able to apply the engineering knowledge that they have. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think if, if they're encouraged to share it with uh, instructors or demonstrators uh, who can help them see how to, to, uh, to develop a, a model that they can then uh, apply engineering principles to, then it's great. In a somewhat related area, we also have someone who wants to know, how do you find inspiration for new examples? 
Okay, well, I tend not to sit in my office and do this. Uh, when I'm uh, writing these uh, examples uh, for the website and for the booklets, I tend to sit at home. Um, and I tend not to just sit at my desk, but to, uh, to walk around the house in the garden, go out and see what my kids are doing, uh, and look for uh, examples based on things I see around me. Uh, and so I think uh, it's important not to sit in your uh, academic office and try and dream them up. It, I don't find that very inspirational. Um, and I try them out on, on uh, my students. Uh, so most of us um, see students uh, on a one-to-one -one basis or in small group tutorials. And so you can try ideas out on them and see what sort of reaction uh, you get. Um, I have uh, teenage kids uh, who, who are at uh, university age, and so I can try them out on them too. Uh, and some of you will have that privilege. Uh, so inspiration, I think, really comes from, from getting out there and, and uh, living life rather than sitting in our offices. Great. We have a number of questions about asking about specific E3s and even some wonderful people who want to know if they could work with us to create new, th new E3s. Music so, your ears, Pat, eh? Hey, I know. We're, we're recruiting people. This is very exciting. So yes, we would very much like you to develop some E3s with us. And Ian, if you could go to the next slide, we'll, we'll tell them how. Yeah, sure. Just um, give me a moment here. If you're interested, that what we'd like to do is have you be in touch with us. That um, we're very interested. I know one of the people was interested in forensic, uh, doing activities tied to forensic science, which certainly, as it fits into different engineering fields, would be fabulous. Um, the math person, uh, we would love to have you involved. We would like, we have some math examples. We need more, particularly with calculus and differential equations. And we would very much be interested in people who, do, who would be interested in doing more work on, um, in electrical engineering kind of fields. Uh, if you need inspiration, uh, Ian will invite you to go into his backyard and work with his kids. And that should work. But if, if you don't have time to go to England, um, we have lots of ideas, you know, including using saltwater taffy to demonstrate viscosity and stress. Or one of my personal favorites um, is using squirt guns to help explain plain collet flow. And the good news is that the author of each accepted E3 or E cube will receive $150 thank you honorarium. You keep the copyright, you give us permission to use it, and you get an honorarium, and your dean also get, or your department chair, your choice, also gets a, a thank you note from us and telling them how wonderful you are. Now, we don't recommend, unless you already have something written, we, if you're going to develop something, we recommend you get in touch with us first about your idea, and that way we can work with you with your idea and, and see if there are ways that we can work together on it. Um, so please uh, help us and, and come uh, do some of that with us. Um, I know we got one person who was asking about uh, E3s at the junior and senior level as well as perhaps at the graduate level. And that's certainly, it's not the thrust of our project because our thrust is uh, the first and second year students, but on the other hand, it's it's great, and we'd be happy to work with you about helping you find some, or if you've got some that also have potential to be used with um, other students, we would be delighted to do that. So we still have more questions, and which is very exciting to me. Uh, but we did want you to, to realize that we really want you to be part of this process. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading more questions as they come in. Uh, so that please join us and be part of the process. Ian, there's a very interesting question that just come in about um, are there patterns that you think are similar across the real life examples that you've been developing uh, that are tied to how you, you teach the concepts that go with them? Um, we can certainly group the um, examples that, that uh, we've developed over the last uh, four or five years probably into three um, groups. One associated with the home, 
um, one associated with uh, student uh, transport, so uh, bikes and, and uh, skateboards and the like, uh, and uh, one group associated with, um, I was going to say sports, but maybe we should say leisure activities rather than just sports. And so I think mm. if you look at the examples we've developed, they've, most of them fall into one of those three categories. Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's a um, a classification or a, or a correlation between the type of engineering principle that we're trying to uh, illustrate and the examples that we're using. If anything, we're, we're trying to, to break some of the, the traditional um, perceptions of uh, uh, engineering topics and use rather different things to engage the students. So I, I would kind of hope there was no correlation, but I guess it would be interesting for a third party to have a look and see if there were any. That's, that sounds very useful. Now, Ian, someone else came up with a question, or actually a comment, which is they tend to use several E3s at once, so like a couple of cooking examples, and do example, 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 and then concepts. Is that something that you've tried? Um, I, I tend to try and um, pull a concept out of each example. Uh, and, and so make the examples uh, uh, work for me. Uh, and, uh, and that also allows the students to focus on, on a single example and for you to go a little bit deeper. Uh, so for instance, the, the skateboard example I uh, gave you, that the, um, the later exercises that are built on it are really quite advanced and, and uh, quite sophisticated for the students. And, I, and uh, so I prefer to go that route. Uh, and then when I've um, squeezed as much as I can out of an example, um, bring another one in and, and uh, do the same again. Um, mm -hmm. I find personally that's more effective than hitting them with three different examples and then trying to pull a concept out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, had, I, I know we're running close to our time, the end of our time, but there was one very interesting question I wanted to bring up, which is uh, someone who says, I use and bring a lot of real life components to the machine design class and students seem to like and understand the concepts discussed in the class. But when you test them on an exam, their performance is back to normal, not so good. So understand, understanding is different than their ability to perform on exams if we test them using the conventional way. So what do we do about that? Well, maybe the telling clause was the last one if we test them in the conventional <laughs> way. Um, <laughs> And uh, whilst they may, may be enthusiastic about the fact that uh, you're bringing things into class, which, which makes it a lot more interesting than a, a dry uh, lecture style, uh, then they may not um, be gaining as much understanding of the example as you think. Um, so they're, they're enthusiastic about it, um, but they haven't taken away the depth of understanding that they might get if, we, if you use examples that they've met previously. I, I'm guessing that when we're talking about bringing things into machine design and so on, they're bits of engines and cars and so on um, that they may not have seen before. And so we're, we're back to the, um, not necessarily panicking because they're enthusiastic that, that there's physical things for them to hold, um, but they're still trying to process what this uh, artifact is and what role it plays in the um, machine or device you've taken it out of. Uh, and so that may be limiting their um, ability to learn and understand from it that's been revealed by the exam process. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm, I've tried to use things that they've met before, that they're very familiar with, and so we don't have them going through the process of trying to appreciate what the artifact is you're putting in front of them. Thanks, Ian, and I think your point about having the testing kind of match what it is that you're doing that are your goals, as well as the, uh, the, you're pointing out the concept can engage the students, but engagement is not enough unless it's followed up with the kinds of work uh, that the students really need to understand the concepts. Um, so people, thank you so much for this. Um, lots of questions, lots of good folks. And um, but unfortunately, our time is coming to an end. So just I wanted to Thank you on behalf of Engage for attending today. And yes, we will be emailing, uh, we will be sending you the PDFs. 
And uh, for the person who asked about the slides, the slides will be up on the Engage website. Um, and we will also send you the link to the webinar. And remember, in four weeks or so, when you get the copies of Ian's books by PDF, please use them and pass them on to the colleague, your colleagues. And have your colleagues go to the website, too. We have lots and lots of stuff up there. Now, once we finish, uh, if you would take a minute to complete the survey that's going to pop up, that would be wonderful. Thanks again for ha taking the time to attend, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.